Hi people, welcome back. I'm Nate and this is Backstage Spotlight, the podcast behind the music you love. Thank you to everyone who subscribed so far. It's much, much appreciated. Make sure that you give us a rating on iTunes or the podcast, which is actually Apple Podcasts. Find us there, give us a rating. It's much appreciated. That's the only way we can climb up the new and noteworthy charts to become new and noteworthy, I guess. So much appreciated to everyone who's actually done that in the last few days. And yeah, just keep following us. If there's any suggestions of any guests you really want to hear on the show, please let me know as well. You can find the website is on my personal website, which is nateholdenmusic.com forward slash backstage spotlight. And you'll find links to all of the episodes that we've already put up, plus any news as and when it comes. There will be a few announcements coming very shortly. And also I've got some great guests coming on the show as well. So make sure that you subscribe, tell your friends, because you don't want to miss some of these stories. I promise you, I promise you, you're going to enjoy the next few coming up. So today's episode is slightly different. Today, I'm all by myself. Today, I've decided to do a podcast dedicated to Black History Month because it is Black History Month right now. And obviously, I'm not in school anymore. I don't know exactly what happens in schools around this time. But I remember when I was in school, a lot of the stuff we were exposed to was inevitably to do with America. So we looked at the slave trade. We looked at Martin Luther King. You know, we wouldn't touch Malcolm X because for, you know, Malcolm X was way too radical for a lot of people. So Malcolm X wasn't really touched upon. Um, And from what I can remember, that was about it, to be honest with you. I don't remember us going into much detail um, with the Black British experience anyway. Um, I know in recent times there's been a few BBC documentaries and programs which try to highlight certain things that happened during that time. But in school, I don't remember really explicitly being being taught about those things, which for me is was it was on two. There's two different ways to look at it. It was a big deal because at the end of the day, this is um, it's not just our history if you live in Britain, but more personally, as my my family come from the Caribbean it's a bit more personal to me at the same time because I am from the Caribbean there's certain things that I already knew about and already experienced myself so for especially for those who who weren't from the Caribbean which were like everyone else basically for them all they were getting exposed to was like I said the American um, civil rights movement Dr. Martin Luther King and the slave trade which as we know does not sum up anywhere close to anything to do with um, what I believe Black History Month should be about. Sure, we should learn about those figures and and certain things that happen, such as the slave trade. But there are, you know, history did not start, Black history did not start with the slave trade. And there's a whole debate to be had about what is black anyway. Um, And also just looking at where we are, we are in England. There are a lot of people, a, a lot of influential people who have passed on, but actually who are still alive, who have done so much for the advancement of black people in this country. And not only black people, but we're talking about um, this term that people are using now, BME, people of um, black and minority ethnics, just in terms of inclusivity, in terms of diversity, and in terms of, what else can you, yeah, in terms of everything else. So, Today, because obviously this is a music podcast, I just want to focus on one particular person who, to be honest, means a lot to me. Um, Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He passed away in the year 2000. Um, But there is, I think, I, I can't remember where I first saw this video, but I remember taking out one of his CDs from the library when I was at university and just really being fascinated by what he, the music that he produced. The person I'm talking about is Lord Kitchener, and he actually arrived on the SS Empire Windrush when it docked in Tilbury, um, and that was on the 22nd of June, 1948. Now, many of you might have had relatives who were on that ship, and if you do, then you'll know that the voyage actually lasted for four weeks, which is unreal to think of. I'm sure a lot of you listening, you might know this already, but for those of you who don't know, 
obviously in 1948 the there wasn't the the there wasn't the the ability to travel as quickly as we do now obviously so people had to take a boat and it took four weeks but on that trip a man named by the name of lord kitchener who was not an ordinary person he was already famous um he was from trinidad he was famous in trinidad and around the caribbean and he actually wrote a song and when he got off the empire windrush Parthay news were there and they interviewed him and the result of the interview sounded a bit like this right now yes london is the place for me london this lovely city you can go to france or america india asia or australia but you must come back to london city well believe me i am speaking broad-mindedly i am glad to know my mother country i've been traveling the countries years ago but this is the place i wanted to know darling london this is the place for me I guess that's almost the equivalent of being on fire in the booth or something, right? Someone comes up to you with a microphone and, you know, those are his bars that he wrote while he was on the boat. And um, there's a lot to be said about that short little poem, poem, that short little song that he, that he said. I mean, you think about the words. London is the place for me. This is coming from someone who, as far as I'm aware, had never stepped foot in London to begin with. But here he is in front of essentially the world's media telling them how London is the place for him. Like the song says, you can go to France or America, India or Australia, but you must come back to London City. If you get a chance, make sure you go online and you find this song and listen to the rest of it because um, after he, well, I'm not sure if he finished writing the whole song while he was on the boat, but he recorded the whole song eventually. And um, he goes on to talk about how he knows his mother country He's been traveling to countries, but, and that's the key word, but this is the place I wanted to know, he says, London, that is the place for me. Many of you might have, um, I don't know who exactly who's listening to this, but some of you might have relatives who actually either were on that Windrush or came in that generation. And from the stories I've been told, many of our grandparents, because it was, for me, in my age, it was my grandparents' age, um, they were almost promised the world. They came with the expectation that they would only stay for a few years. You know, they'd work hard and then they'd go back home, carry on with their lives with a few extra extra quid in their pocket, if you want to say that. But we're still here. But that's another story for another time. Going back to Lord Kitchener, he, as like I said, he was already famous in the Caribbean. So Obviously, when he came, he wanted to continue his musical career. So that's exactly what he did. Um, he started becoming fairly popular on the BBC um, with his music because the record companies saw that, you know, as, as, as many industries do, they see the market straight away. So that's what he started to do. And eventually, a man by the name of, what's his man's name? Dennis Preston, that's it, heard him and invited him to go and record in 1950. So this is only two years um, after he actually arrived. But he went to Abbey Road Studios and recorded there. At night, when you have nothing to do, you can take a walk down Shaftesbury Avenue. There you would laugh and talk and enjoy the bridge and admire the beautiful scenery of London. That's the best of One of the important things I think about Lord Kitchener is that not only is he someone from the Caribbean who's come over and is starting to adapt his music to his new surroundings, but he's telling stories and he's being very, very brutal and very, very honest. Um, as we go through this podcast, you'll hear a few more examples of what I'm talking about. But this first example I want to play to you now um, comes from a song called The Underground Train. Now, there's not much depth in this clip that I'm going to play for you, but it's just interesting and I'm sure you'll find it fairly funny if you've, I know there's listeners from around the world, so maybe you haven't been to London, but if you do come, you'll understand straight away um, the dilemma that he's facing when he's trying to find his way in the underground and doesn't know where to turn. 
Uh-huh. My first misery is when I embark on Piccadilly. I went down below. I stand up in the crowd. Don't know where to go. I decided to follow a young lady. Well, I nearly met with my destiny. That night was bad luck for Kitchener. I fall down on the escalator. So, boys, I'm going to walk the journey and the party. Hello! So you'll find, as you listen to Kitchener's music, it's littered with stuff like this. It's littered with little things that he's observed about in London that for him, for us who live in London, maybe take it for granted and you get used to it. But for him, you know, as an expat, he's, he's come along and he's just fascinated with what he sees. So I use the word expat for a particular reason. And the reason is this. Most of the time when media talks about people of color, they often refer to them if they've moved country as immigrants. And to be honest with you, it's not even sometimes just people of color. It's, pe- it's, it's almost this, this term other, people who are seen as other of the, um, the status quo. So we even hear, we hear words like the Polish immigrants, for example, um, North African immigrants, um, the West African immigrants, the, you know, the East African immigrants, the asylum seekers, you know, these are, these are just, these are terms which are not used for people originating from England or from America um, who go abroad to Marbella or wherever they decide to go. And they're just called expats. They set up their expat communities. Whereas, you know, the, often the people of color are left to be, you know, they're immigrants. Yeah, I'm a second generation immigrant. Well, well, if you want to say that, then fine. But if we're going to use the word expat as being, you know, as, as, as being the, the ideal, as being the better term to use, then I am deciding to use the word expat to refer to all people who move. Because at the end of the day, um, what is an Im- if we're all if one person is an immigrant, we're all immigrants. If one is an expat, we're all expats. So for the purposes of this, if I say the word expat, now you know exactly why I'm using that word. So as a Caribbean expat, like I said before, Lord Kitchener has a very different way of looking at, at England. And what's fascinating about his music is that he's able to look into the black community itself and analyze what's going on there because um, maybe there were certain things going on in Trinidad as well. Um, I'm not a historian like that to tell you exactly that was true or not. I'm, I would assume so, but he being in England has seen certain things and this song really speaks about um, the issue of, of colorism and how people of different shades treat each other and treat themselves and are perceived in society. <laughs> father is an African, your mother may be Norwegian, you pass me you wouldn't say goodnight, feeling you are really white, your skin may be a little pink, and that's the reason why you think that the complexion of your face can hide you from the Negro race, no, you can never get away from the fact if you not white, you consider black. Some of the words go on to say this. Your Negro hair is obvious. You make it more conspicuous. You use all kinds of Vaseline to make out you are European. Now, for obvious reasons, we might we know why someone might want to change their appearance to look more European. It might not necessarily just have been to um, reject their their heritage and their culture, but it might have been just to get a leg up um, and maybe appear less threatening, more well-educated. As we know in society, even today, colorism exists. We saw it just recently with this with this Dove advert. And okay, before everyone gets their gets in, their knickers in a twist, right? I know that the original advert did not did not portray itself like those I think there were four pictures did with the um, with the white with the black girl taking her her top off and and she revealed to be a white girl and also if you check out the um, interview with um, with the girl herself she explains how she saw it and to be fair after watching after watching the full advert and listening to her 
talk on on TV. I did ch start to change how I thought about it, but the fact remains that if we're going to talk about Dove, Dove have a history of doing certain things like that. You can even go into the shop today and see how one of their one of their products actually says on the on the label um, for normal to dark skin, and obviously dark skin is normal, right? So why would you make that distinction? Anyway, we see it all over the world how there seems to be a preference for for lighter skin over darker skin and it's something that needs to be addressed it is being it is being addressed in many different ways but maybe um somehow i don't have the answers but it's just something obviously that we see in society today but it's clearly as we can see in this example from kitchener it's been going on for what six over 60 years now and we've seen examples in the states um the the example that I like to go to, to be honest with you, is the example of Rosa Parks. If you don't know um, the full story, I've got my own opinion about Rosa Parks, but that will go on for another day, another podcast perhaps. But um, there was a young lady, if you quickly, you can Google it and you can find the information. There's a young lady by the name of Claudette Colvin, who was actually the first person to sit on the bus and protest um, and get arrested for it. It wasn't Rosa Parks who was the first person. And from what I've read and the research I've done um, showed that Claudette Colvin, because for many different reasons, for one, she was underage. I say underage, she was, I believe, 16 or 17 at the time, or even 15, and she had had a child and she was dark skinned. For those reasons, the NAACP decided um, not to put her case, um, not to put her forward as the main, um, as the main, what's the right word? Not they just basically they decided to use and they had to wait because she preceded Rosa Parks by about six months I believe, um they waited until Rosa Parks who um had a totally different standing in society was obviously very close to Martin Luther King beforehand and um was also a light skinned lady as well, um they decided to put that case forward to the Supreme Court and we all know what happened from there, but what's very interesting is if you you can Google YouTube sorry. Claudette Colvin and she she's still alive and she'll tell you the whole story herself um but yeah that's a massive 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 um digression it's a shame it's unfair but what can you do the color of your skin makes it hard for you you can tour the world you still will get no place every door is shut in your face so boys if you prong they say you can stick around if you white Well, everything's all right. But if your skin is dark, no use you try. You're about to suffer until you die. So Kitch himself was very aware of what was going on in the world at the time, um, like we've seen in these other examples. And he was very connected to the African diaspora, if you're aware of your history, around the 1950s, many African states were starting to gain independence. And one of the most significant ones was Ghana. And he released a song um, which celebrated Ghanaian independence. And I'll play a clip for you right now. This day will never be forgotten. The 6th of March, 1957, when the Gold Coast successfully Get your independence officially. Ghana. Ghana is the name. Ghana. We wish to proclaim. We will be jolly, merry and gay. The 6th of March, Independence Day. See, this is one of the things that I love about Kitchener and one of the things that we can learn from now. If there are musicians out there, I'm sure there's a lot of you listening, there might be a gap in the market for for music like this, music which is not only nice to listen to, but it also um, educates as well. I know there's a lot of things for younger, you know, for preschoolers, um, learning, you know, learning the alphabet, learning about, you know, the well, the eight planets now, we learned nine, but you know, now the eight planets, um, multiplication tables and, and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, maybe it's time to revisit that whole area of using music in education um, to convey you know serious themes and um, commemorate serious things that have happened I don't know if there's anyone for example who is writing music about 
I don't know something big that's happened. Even even the bomb that um you know Moab, the mother of all bombs that dropped. I don't know if there are people in 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 the states writing about about that. I'm sure there are. Um, or even things, major things that have happened in the UK, like Brexit, for example. Imagine this is this is essentially what Kitchener's doing. He's essentially being a a, a griot. He's commenting on what's happening around him. Um, he's being relevant. He's staying in the moment, and by doing that, he's he's making music that essentially lasts forever because he's he's preserving history in that moment as he records. So now when we listen to it, we can listen to this this music with different perspectives, see what's changed, see what hasn't changed. Um, and also just enjoy it and just marvel at the creativity of the man. So yeah, that is Lord Kitchener. I don't want to go on anymore because I would love to um, play some more music, but I have to be careful with licensing and stuff like that. Um, you know, there is there is um, fair use, So, but I don't want to overstep the mark, you know what I mean? So... I'll probably leave it there but i would encourage you to check out lord kitchener's music i really feel like he's an important person um to not only to think about in terms of black history month but um just in general like i said you know he's preserved some important time important things that have happened in the past if we're trying to understand ourselves as for one um people who come from the caribbean for two people who live in the uk right now and three just global society People like Kitch who have who have told these stories and preserved these stories through music are extremely, I feel, important and should be given more, more play and more relevance, especially in, in music education in the UK and in history lessons and in Black History Month because there's so much you can learn from someone like him. You can study his music um, from a musical point of view and just break down, you know, the chord structures and the um, the form and all of those things. And you can look at it from a historical point of view and look at how he's um, how he's preserved the time that he was in. You can look at it from um, an English point of view and look at his rhyme schemes and look at how he's phrased certain things and you know his diction on certain words because of his accent and maybe just because he needed to rhyme one word with another. There's so many things you can learn from him. So I'd encourage you, find him on Spotify, on YouTube, um, check out the clip. It's, it's a great short clip to watch. Um, the Parthé News clip when he's on the, on the steps, literally on the steps, I think, of the um, SS Empire Windrush delivering his the you know the, the the song which essentially i guess was an anthem for many caribbean people on that boat looking forward to their new life um in london especially but yeah apart from kitsch to be honest there's a lot of other people who even in their life today um such as dennis bavel who were who were around at the time and who have a lot of knowledge and were innovators in their field. People like um, Gary Crosby and, and, and Jean Toussaint, for example, who have been around and have seen the progression, musically speaking, that is. Um, I really believe that it's time now um, to really dig deeper into the people who have come before us in the UK, your black um, musicians, as this is a music podcast, um, who have come before us and have really blazed the path there's someone who I believe fits into that category as well, who I will be um, speaking to and you will hear that interview very, very soon. And I'm so, I can't even tell you, I'm so excited about this. Um, I'll, I'll say it now and I will repeat it on the, on the show when she comes on. But um, I used to do, a, there was one year for Black History Month, I, I focused on one person every single day. So that was 30 days of September. 31, I'm so bad, 31 different people um, and I avoided all of the main, you know, I avoided Martin Luther King, avoided Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, all the people that we, we always speak about. And she happened to be someone that I found and I'm so happy to be, to be speaking to her. Um, it's next week I'm going to be speaking to her and that episode will be out as soon as possible. But until then, thank you for listening. Oh, one more thing. Something that I learned the other day about Black History Month. The US has it in February. We have it in October. The reason for that, um, it was chosen in February, not just because it not because it was the shortest month of the year. Maybe that was why you're gonna have to ask the Americans, but because actually Frederick Douglass and and Abraham Lincoln, their birthdays fall in 
February. So that's why February was actually chosen to um, be the month for Black History Month. And in England, they decided to use October because it was very, very close to the start of the academic year. And they actually wanted to help to inspire the young um, young black children, essentially, at the start of the academic year rather than somewhere in the middle. So that's what I learned. And I hope you learned that too. And if I'm wrong, please let me know because I might be. So yeah, thank you for listening. Much appreciated. Make sure you subscribe. This has been the first solo podcast I've ever done. So, you know, question, like comments. If you loved it, let me know. If you didn't like it, let me know. But also let me know why so then I can make it better for you. So until then, make sure you listen to some great music. Check out Lord Kitchener. Check out other people. Like I've mentioned, Dennis Bavel. Amazing, amazing musician. I have to get him on the show one day. That has to be done. And um, many, many others who have blazed the path for us. So yeah, listen to some great music. Take care of yourselves and until next time, peace.